Good morning. We'd like to welcome everybody to the services here at Carthage Church of Christ. We're so delighted that everybody could be with us in attendance this morning. Um, if you will be turning with me for the reading in just a second, in Philippians 2, we'll be reading from uh, verses 25 through 30. Again, if you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. Uh, Brother Barry Cook has some visitors packet. He's going to be coming up the aisles in just a second. If you're visiting with us, if you'll raise your hand, we'd love to get you a packet. And if you uh, wouldn't mind to fill that out for us and return it back to the center of the aisle, we'll have somebody come pick that up. It's going to give you a little information about us. And if we could have some information about you, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. So just raise your hand as Barry's coming through. And the reading this morning will be coming from Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all, and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I send him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, and you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. That's the reading. Brother Jeremy will have her sing song service this morning. <coughs> <coughs> All the songs will be on the screen, but if you'd like to use your book, the first song will be number 44. Number 44.
The song before the prayer will be number 242. Number 242. Let's go to God in prayer. We're so thankful, dear Lord, for this wonderful day you've given us to come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray that we always diligently come and study your scripture and uh, are committed to our worship to you because we know it's just a sacred privilege. And we uh, look forward to that day in heaven when we can worship you eternally. And we pray, dear Lord, that we all can do what we need to on earth so that we can have an eternal home in heaven with you someday. We know there are many sick and injured and those who are undergoing various treatments with us today and, and who are unable to be here as well. We pray a special blessing on them and the doctors and nurses that help them out and the family members that, that help take care of them. And we pray that we as a church can do all we can do to assist those who are in need. And we know there's many who do struggle. We're so thankful for Brother Edward and Barbara and the elders and deacons and each and every member here. And we pray that we can work together to, to do good and uh, to spread the, the glory of your kingdom to this community around us. We're especially thankful for the wonderful week we've had at our gospel meeting and uh, just thankful for that effort and brother Allen who is with us we pray dear Lord that you go with us as we go through the rest of this service and we're especially thankful of Jesus and your love for us that you would send him to earth to die for our sins and we're just so thankful for that pray you go with us as we continue our worship in Jesus name amen <coughs> If you're using your books and would like to mark the Song of Invitation, it'll be number 772. After the lesson, we'll sing 772. The song before, we'll sing number 543. Number 543. If you're able, let's stand for this song.
<clears throat> if you like to take notes on the lesson, you can see or get the usher's attention as they come down the aisle and they will give you a basic outline of today's lesson and you can fill in the blanks and write down scriptures and make additional notations on that piece of paper. I know that a lot of people do that and I appreciate it. A lot of our young people do that. I sometimes find uh, some copies of that that have been filled out and laid down maybe in a place where you forget them. <coughs> And I appreciate the fact that there are people who utilize those. One of our members suggested that doing that many years ago. And we, have, we started it and we continued it up until this point in time. As mentioned in the prayer, we have had a wonderful week. We had a great area-wide gospel meeting with five different churches of Christ involved in it. And uh, many of you were there every single night. And we appreciate the great support that we had in that effort. Brother Alan Webster did a tremendous job preaching the gospel. Jeff Crockett led the singing. Various of our brethren and other brothers led singing beginning at 6.30. And it was just really a great, great experience to be there and be a part of it. And I received word this morning that a young man was baptized on Friday night. And I have no doubt that that gospel meeting had a great part to play in that. The last sermon was about heaven, and uh, it certainly stirred us deeply to think about that. And we have sung about heaven this morning. Silence, please. I could stand here for a few minutes and watch all the different responses. Did you ever have a teacher that said that? And you could tell from the tone of voice that that meant you had better be quiet. My seventh grade teacher weighed 300 pounds. And early in life he had a nickname, Bloody Bill. As they would say in the phone, the farms up in Jackson County, he would have fought a circle saw. He lived to fight. He changed later in life, was a faithful member of the Lord's church for many years. But he was still a fearless man. And when he walked into the classroom when I was in seventh grade, I knew he meant business. And when he spoke, we all said, yes, sir. He was fair, great teacher. You've heard me tell some stories about him. He said the first day of school, when we work, we work harder than anybody in this school building. When we play, we play harder than anybody in this school building. And he set out some guidelines, and we accomplished just about every one of those during that school year as a class. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, you read this statement, The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. The words of that verse have been put to music and we sometimes sing it. And it is a beautiful hymn and it is a wonderful thought with which to begin a period of worship such as this. The Lord is in His holy temple. Today the church is the temple of God. The book of Ephesians bears that out. And we gather together as an assembly of saints to worship God as His church. We do not worship the building. The building is not the church that Jesus built. We build church buildings, that is buildings in which to meet and assemble. But the brick and the mortar and the stone and the wood and all the nails are not the church. 
The church is that glorious spiritual institution built by Jesus, Matthew 16, 18, and is an institution that will stand the tests of time. As we talk about this subject of silence, going back to that text for a moment, if you'll read the context, which I hope you will, there is a contrast being drawn between pagan worship and worship to God. And those people were worshiping gods that they had themselves produced. And pagan worship was characterized by all sorts of shenanigans. There was much music, there was dancing, Drugs may have been even involved in much of it to produce all kinds of reactions in worship to these pagan gods. Now in sharp contrast to that, the prophet says, the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Though it was the religion of their choice, the pagans did not have a right to worship all those deities. God created those individuals. The earth that they enjoyed fruit and food from belonged to the true God. The God of heaven and earth, the one who created all things. All that they had belonged to Him. The wood, the stone, the metal, out of which they had carved these images, all of those things belonged to God. And yet they were not worshiping Him. But in Habakkuk's day, God's people had lost their way and they had begun to worship many of those pagan gods. And so this text is a very, very powerful text. But have you ever thought about the fact that silence can be very loud? Coal miners and the coal mines would often take canaries in cages with them. And when the canaries stop singing... The miners knew that that silence denoted danger. Sometimes those birds would die from the lack of oxygen. And when they became silent, that was a signal to the miners to evacuate the mine and get out. Some kind of poisonous gas, simply a lack of oxygen, whatever, could be the cause. Silence is something that can be very loud. A young man and a young woman were married. They no doubt enjoyed their love and their new uh, relationship, you know. But before long, she became very ill and passed away. He confided in others. When I went back home, the silence in that house was the loudest thing I'd ever heard. Silence can be extremely loud. God's silence is loud and eloquent. In Revelation 22, 18, and 19, John the Apostle ended that particular book, the last book of the Bible, in the last chapter. He says, See that you do not add to or take from what is written in this book. God does not want His Word tampered with. He wants it to be left alone. 
God has spoken. He has told us all that we need to know. There are secret things that belong to God, the book of Deuteronomy reveals, and we need to leave it there. And to show respect to His silence. So as we go to think about silence, I want to look at the two approaches that are taken in the religious world concerning silence. You'll see a quote here that states, Speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent. Thomas Campbell is given credit for that particular statement, that particular thought. But I submit to you that that thought does not originate with Thomas Campbell or any other man. That statement originates in Scripture. Oh, it may not be in those exact words. But when God said, Do not add to, do not take from, how could we better put it into our language than to say, Speak where God speaks and be silent where God is silent. That is clearly what the import of that passage is, isn't it? Thomas Campbell came to this country in the early 1800s. He had left, I believe, Scotland, came here. And uh, he, along with his son, Alexander, had grown tired of the division of denominationalism. And they began to think in terms of why can't we just all be Christians and wear the name of Christ only and do Bible things in Bible ways, call Bible things by Bible names. And if the Bible authorizes something, let's do it. If it doesn't, let's not do it. Let's do away with all of these divisive titles and cut down on the division that is seen in the religious world. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul talks about the fact that we should not go beyond what is written. We should not go beyond what is written. God has revealed the sum total of truth to us in His Word. The Holy Spirit was to come upon the apostles and guide them into some truth? No. They were to be guided into all truth. The Word of God that we have is sufficient in all areas. Reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. The Word of God furnishes us completely in those areas, as seen in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Now, that first approach to Bible study, religious practice, all of those things there involved, that first approach respects the silence of the Scriptures, the silence of God. But the second approach is that anything not expressly forbidden, as in thou shalt not, is allowed. That's permitted, we're told today. There are those who ask the question, is the silence of the scriptures permissive? are prohibitive. That is, does it, does the silence, if the Bible doesn't mention something, does that mean we're free to do it, regardless? Or does it prohibit us in reference to making innovations and coming up with things that are nowhere alluded to in the Scriptures? Now those are the two approaches that are found in the religious world today. Some say where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we're silent. Others say anything that is not expressly forbidden by the Scriptures, 
is permitted. Now, when you follow that line of logic to its logical conclusion, you get to the point where you can say that in religion, just about anything goes. Because there's lots of things that you could sneak in, bring in, under the guise of, well, it doesn't say not do it. So since it doesn't say thou shalt not do it, it must be all right to do it. Let's examine this a bit further. There are many scriptures that show that silence is prohibitive. Let's look at some of them in the next few minutes. From the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 4, we read of Cain's offering. There in verses 3 and 4 of that particular chapter, you will find that Cain and Abel bring their sacrifices. It's not long, evidently, after the creation, but... We read of the beginning of Adam and Eve's family in the first couple of verses. Cain and Abel were born. And then verse 3 mentions that in the process of time, or with the time passing by, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now analyze that statement a minute. Cain brought. He brought something. We're supposed to bring gifts to God. We're to give of our means upon the first day of the week. So giving goes back a long ways to the dawning of time. Cain brought. What did he bring? He brought of the fruit of the ground. There are situations found in the scriptures where the grain and other things were to be brought and offered to God as an offering. So this is not the first time now, or the only time in the Bible, that someone brought the fruit of the ground. It was close probably to the first time. May have been the very first time. But he brought of the fruit of the ground. What did he bring? An offering. He's generous. He's giving. He brought of the fruit of the ground unto the Lord. It was given to the Lord. It was designed in Cain's mind to bring glory to God. So he brought an offering. There's many commendable things about this. But, Cable we're, Abel, we're told, brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, verse 4 tells us, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Now why would you say God had not respect for Cain's? It was an offering. It was brought voluntarily, willingly, it was brought unto the Lord. The only thing that we can conclude is by going to other passages of Scripture, such as Hebrews 11, 4, that Abel offered his sacrifice, the Hebrews writer says, by faith. Now what is faith? Faith is that which is produced by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So Abel must have heard what God said, and God must have commanded him, I want an offering, an animal sacrifice. I want you to bring the firstling of your flock. That's what I want. Now it stands to reason that God had given the same information to Cain. Because if he had told Cain, bring me an offering, wouldn't have made any difference what the offering was. <coughs> so God would have been a respecter of persons 
if he rejected Cain's sacrifice just arbitrarily. There must have been a standard. There had to be. Or God would have shown respect of persons, not respect in reference to what was being offered. Notice, it is not so much Abel that God respects. He respected Abel's offering, which must have been by faith, because the Hebrews writer says it was. So God had commanded these boys concerning what was to be offered. And the only logical conclusion is that Cain showed disrespect for God's word. And he offered something which God had not commanded. God's silence was not respected. Maybe Cain could have come back and said, But you didn't say, Don't offer this. God didn't have to. When he commanded the firstlings of the flock of Abel, that excluded everything else. No other sacrifice would have been acceptable. Look at the principle also in reference to Noah's ark. Hebrews 11, 7 tells us that Noah also was directed by faith. And in Genesis 6, verse 22, according to all the things that God commanded Noah, so did he. And it's been pointed out many times that the dimensions of the ark, the door, the window that were to be put in it, the taking of the animals into the ark, the numbers and all of that, the dimensions of the ark as we stated, the wood that was to be used. It was said to be, take gopher wood and build this ark. Now it may have been a very, very likely fact that Noah would have chosen that wood to begin with. We don't know a whole lot about gopher wood. But God said, that's the wood I want you to use. Now, he didn't have to go down the long list and name all the other trees that he had created and placed upon the earth and say, Noah, don't use pine, don't use hickory, don't use beech, don't use maple, don't use oak. All he had to do was say, build it of gopher wood. And he could be silent about the rest of those woods and Noah was obligated to respect that silence. I think we can see that very clearly. Nadab and Abihu strange fire in Leviticus 10. There you will read that Nadab and Abihu offered fire unto the Lord that is described as strange fire. Strange fire. God would often use the word strange to denote that which was prohibited. And so it is here that when God gave the instructions, uh, instructions concerning the fire to be used in worship in the tabernacle, He said, you get it off the altar. You can read Leviticus 16, 12. And there is specific mention made of that fire. When you read Leviticus 10, a few chapters earlier, you will find that Nadab and Abihu offered fire which God commanded not. Somebody says one fire is as good as another. No, not in this case. And really not in any case. When men are working with metal, there are different blazes that they use in their torches to work with different types of metal. Sometimes it's too hot. Sometimes it's not hot enough, so it has to be adjusted. So really, any fire is not just okay. Well, God said, here's where I want you to get the fire, from off the altar. They evidently got it elsewhere. And there was a fire that went out and consumed those two boys. God demonstrated His lack of respect for strange fire. 
Look at the principle of silence in reference to the Ark of the Covenant. In Deuteronomy 10 verse 8, we learn that the Levites were to be in charge of the Ark of the Covenant, carrying it and all of that. They were to carry it, uh, to carry it, move it from one place to another in a specified way. There were rings of sort that were put on each corner of the Ark of the Covenant. And there was what we would call a shaft or pole that was to be run through those rings and then picked up those shafts, ends of the shafts, put on the shoulders of men. And they had to be from the right tribe and all of that. And that Ark of the Covenant was to be transported from one place to another in that way. You remember the case of Uzzah being struck dead when he reached forth his hand to steady the Ark of the Covenant that had been placed on a new ox cart and being drawn as it passed across a thrashing floor. It began to tilt and joshle and he thought it's going to fall off and so he reached out and touched it and he was killed for that act. God had said, don't touch it. David was angry with God until he went back and read the instructions that had been given long before his day that were still intact. And in 1 Chronicles 15, David comes back and says, look, we messed up. God didn't make a mistake. We fail to read what God had said about it and we fail to honor what He had said. The Levites are supposed to transport that ark. And from this point on, David said, that's the way it's going to be done. They did not respect God's silence. Did God have to say, nobody from Issachar can carry it. Issachar was one of the ten, uh, 12 tribes. Nobody from Zebulun can carry it. Well, he didn't have to say that. He said the Levites are going to be set aside for this specific thing. And that's what they did. They went back to that. The silence of God. The prohibition of idolatry. In Exodus 20, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God said in that passage. I want, to, I want to take you to a passage in Jeremiah, I believe it is. Yes, Jeremiah chapter 7. There are a couple of verses that I want you to look at. God said through Jeremiah in verse 3 of, of Jeremiah 7, Thus saith the Lord God, or the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways. Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. They needed to make amends, as we sometimes say, because they had fallen away from God. Now, when you go down to verse 31, it says that they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not. Here were people who were making sacrifices of their own animals, or their own children rather. They were taking their sons and daughters and putting them in the fire. Now here's another thought, and I really haven't checked this out in great depth and detail. But you remember in the times of Jesus, this was the valley where garbage and trash were burned. The smoke of their torment ascends up forever is a statement that reflects what was going on in this dump in the valley of Hinnom just outside Jerusalem. Could it be that they were already 
doing that back in the days of Jeremiah and just throwing away their babies as so much garbage to be consumed in that what was called the eternal fire in the valley of Hinnom. It burned all the time, smoldered, smoked. Was that what they were doing or were they erecting an altar and placing their children on them and burning them? Whichever the case, that was a tragedy, wasn't it? God said, I've never commanded that. You need to respect my silence. Let's go to the New Testament right quickly. The silence is seen to be prohibitive in the New Testament as well. Paul reminds us, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, about the danger of going beyond what is written. Did your mother ever write you out a grocery list and send you to the grocery store? She had 10 items on it and you came back with 20 or 30 because... You say, why, Mom, you didn't say not get this. Not too long ago, I took my truck for a, to be serviced, oil change and filter change and all that. When I came back, the proprietor of the business said, uh, Edward, I hope it was all right. I saw that your tires were kind of worn on the front, and so we, we rotated your tires. Only about 10 extra bucks. But you know, I could have said, no, I'm not going to pay that. Because I didn't authorize it. I didn't tell him to do that. I said, I just want the usual oil change and check every, all the fluid levels and all that. Didn't say a word to him about the tires. He's a good friend. He, he, knew, he knows me. I know him. I said, I'll pay it this time, but <laughs> no, I didn't even say that. I said, that's okay. And I went ahead and paid it. But we can't go beyond what is written. In, verse, in Colossians 2, verses 22 through 23, you have an introduction to what is called will worship. I believe Brother Webster talked about this in one of the lessons that he preached last week. W.E. Vine, in talking about will worship, makes this, uh, notation. He said, will worship is that which is volunt it's voluntarily adopted worship, whether unbidden or forbidden. I believe it was Brother Wayne Jackson who made a note on that. He said, now Vine says, whether it is unbidden. Have you ever used the word unbidden? And Brother Jackson said, if unbidden doesn't mean that God is silent about it, what does it mean? If it's, something is unbidden, that means it's not mentioned. So why, who are we to presume why? It'd be all right to do that. Because God doesn't say not do. We have to be very careful. We're on shaky ground when we get to doing things in worship because we want it, we like it, or we know people who do, and so we're going to do this. Moses' silence concerning the angels. He said, to which of the angels did God say, you're my son? He didn't say that to them. To whom did God say that? Hebrews 1 tells us. He said that to Jesus. You're my son, this day I have begotten thee. So that rules out the angels being on par with Jesus Christ. And then in chapters 8 verse 4 and 7 14, the Hebrews writer makes mention of the fact that nothing is said of one from the tribe of Judah becoming a high priest in the law of Moses. The high priest was to be a Levite. So Jesus could not serve as a high priest if the old law is still in effect today. Why? Because it was not authorized. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. High priests had to come 
from the tribe of Levi. So what would be necessary for Jesus to serve as our high priest? There had to be a change of the law. And so you go from the old covenant, which foretold the coming of the new covenant as well. 2 John verse 9 talks about those who go onward and abide not in the doctrine of Christ. Very much related to 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. Going beyond what is written. John the Apostle of Love says it's a dangerous thing to go onward and abide not in the doctrine of Christ. Okay, next slide. Notice these applications. The New Testament tells us that there is only one way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. In Acts 4 verse 12, there is salvation and none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In what name are we saved? The name of Christ. That's what's under consideration in Acts 4 12. Romans 1 16 says, For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile or the Greek. And in Hebrews 5 verse 9, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation. To whom? To those who obey Him. To those who obey Him. So we must obey the gospel of Christ and come to God through Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. That's pointed out in Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, and a host of other passages. God has not said anything about there being another way of salvation. He doesn't have to specify, you can't come through the Hindu religion, you can't come through uh, Confucianism, you can't come through this ism, that ism, whatever. He doesn't have to specify that. He said salvation is in Christ. That excludes any other location. No church, but Christ's church. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. We learn that He is the head of that church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5, verse 23. There's no other. God doesn't have to go down a long litany of names and say, mention all of those. He has said, upon this rock I will build my church. And Ephesians 4, 4 says that there is one body, and the body is the church. No other worship than worshiping in spirit and in truth. God doesn't have to mention every little thing about worship that He doesn't want. When He prescribes what He wants us to do, then all other things are forbidden. Many times, go to the conclusion, we forget that that which is done for God must be done God's way. So many times people will introduce things into worship without any concern. They say, well, everybody likes this. Well, everybody is not God. God, we learned last week, is the object of our worship and He is the audience of our worship. May we never forget that. Too many are too busy seeking too much to please themselves and the masses. I wonder sometimes if we're not too busy to even hear what God says tell you a quick little illustration here. Most of us don't remember this time, but years ago, especially in the northern regions where deep freezes lasted for weeks and weeks and weeks, people would go to the lake or the river and cut out a huge hunk of ice and take it and put it in the ice house and cover it up with sawdust. And it would stay there for a long time and they could come out and get a chunk off that, you know, and take it to their houses to, to use as they needed it in their uh, ice boxes there. 
There was a man whose job it was to put ice in that. He went out and cut the huge hunk of ice, brought it in, covered it up with sawdust, and realized sometime later that he had lost his watch and that it was probably in that ice house. And there were people who went in there and they looked and looked and looked and looked and scratched, scratched around the sawdust and they could not find the, sawdust, uh, the watch. There was a little boy who sneaked into the ice house one day and he laid down on the floor of the ice house in the sawdust. After a while, he came out with the watch. The owner and all the grown men were just baffled. He said, how in the world did you find that? He said, I went in there and laid down. And in the silence, I heard it ticking. Sometimes we are so busy, we can't get quiet enough to hear what God is saying in his silence. I hope you'll remember that. God has said, obey the gospel. Hear it, believe it, repent of your sins, make the good confession, be baptized into my son, and I'll wash away your sins in his blood. If you're an erring child of God, then you need to listen to what God says. And hear him when he says, if you will repent and confess your sins and pray, I'll forgive you. And you can be restored. If you're subject, please come as we stand and sing.